Thank you for watching the Table Community Church video podcast. We hope you enjoyed this week's message. Hey, what's going on, y'all? Great to see you. How you doing? Cool. Hey, I wanted to share with you from Psalms this morning before we uh, begin worship. Uh, Psalm 66, it says, Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give him uh, glorious praise. Say to God how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. So uh, may we kind of just meditate on that as we sing uh, this morning. Let's stand and sing together. Coming on the clouds, let's sing this together. He's coming on the clouds, kings and kingdoms will bow. The chain and daily chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, oh, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, though the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chain. Every knee will bow before the lion and the man. Every knee will bow before him. So open up the gates, see now. So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. God who comes to say, our God who comes to say, is here to set the captives free. But who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, oh the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, oh, the Lamb that was slain. For the sin of the world, His blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow. together this morning is our prayer. We're going to see who can stop the Lord Almighty because this morning we believe that nothing can stop the Lord Almighty. Regardless of circumstance, regardless of the pain we might be going through this morning or the struggle, nothing stops the Lord. The Lord works in our lives. The Lord is good. So let's sing this together. Who can stop? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Keep singing that. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 Who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion, oh the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will 
Your love song when I was low. Your love sought me when I was low. The wanderer on a broken road, shame. And shame shackled my heart in doubt. I was lost in sin, but you brought me voice in it. Your voice shattered the dead of night. With just one breath, every wrongs me right. Soul in victory. My soul in victory, safe from harm. Shouts, I'm free, I'm free in my Savior's arms. I'm free, I'm free in my Savior's arms. I pray to love with your voices. And oh, how great your love is. How deep your kindness. How sweet your grace. Strong in mercy. And oh, how strong your mercy.
that our God is alive and our hearts are free. We believe, we believe that King Jesus, He is alive indeed. That King Jesus, He is alive indeed. That King Jesus, He is alive indeed. And oh. so much love that you would uh, send your son to die on the cross for our sins. Those who have faith in you um, will live with you forever in glory. We thank you for that. God, we thank you that we can come together today or maybe we're watching online uh, with our family, that we can come together and worship you for your love for us, for your goodness, and for your grace. God, we give you um, this service. We give you our lives, and we say, have your way. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. We are so glad that you're here with us this morning, whether you're watching online or you're here in this room. If this is your first time, uh, we want to invite you to text uh, the word welcome to 817-755-1668. We're so glad that you would come and worship with us this morning. And um, I I don't know um, how many of you know this, but this Wednesday, uh, we had our first Wednesday back um, here in Table Students in this room. Um, as, as much as it could be um, with all that's going on with capacity, it was, it was filled with 6th through 12th graders. And it was so good to be back in here worshiping together and, and, and growing closer to God. And, and the thing that we talked about um, was what it means to be adopted by God. And, and just the process of adoption and God's love for us. But in Ephesians 1, um, starting in verse 4, at the end of verse 4, it says this, uh, this, these two words. It says, in love that God predestined to adopt us as sons in Jesus Christ. And I know for me, one of the things that I think about often is um, not just God's ability to save us, but his desire to. That in love, like he came to earth for us. And that's a big deal because I know a lot of people, when they they think about God and they think about God, God as a father and maybe their experience with a father maybe here on earth was not the best and so it's really hard for them to see like the why behind he would do it but when we read it it says that in love this was God's plan from the beginning of time this was his will for us to adopt us and to call us sons and daughters and so wherever you are today just remember that in love God acted He didn't just sit in heaven and say he loved us, but he came and he proved it by coming to the cross for our sake so that we could be, those of us who have faith in him, could be with him forever. So as we continue to worship, let us us think about that. Let us reciprocate God's love, respond in such a way that would say, God, in love you came, and so in love I give give of myself, my resources, my time, whatever it is, in love, I respond to you.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, as we gather here together this morning, Father, we thank you for your love and your grace that you've extended to us. Father, sometimes as we look at the circumstances of our lives, we, we forget and we lose sight of all of the good things that you've given to us. And so, Father, today, may we see your hand at work in our lives. May we experience your presence. Father, as we gather together, I know that many of us come with different burdens that we're carrying. And, Father, thanks for the promise that you've given to us that helps us to know that you want to take those burdens from us, that we're to cast our cares upon you because you care for us. And so, Father, even now as those requests are upon our hearts, Father, I pray that you would meet every need that we have. 
And in these moments, may we learn to trust in you more. Father, thanks for sending your son Jesus who willingly laid down his life so that we could know you. Father, I pray that you are honored and glorified by everything that takes place here. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. It's good to see everybody uh, today. If I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, my name is Bill. It's my privilege to serve as the lead pastor here at the table. So for those of you that are joining us online, thanks for checking us out there as well on this Labor Day weekend, right? So we kind of got a long weekend for everybody, which really seems odd. Um, it's another one of those odd experiences that we have this year. We had a few folks from our church celebrate Labor Day weekend yesterday by doing some labor um, for us. So we greatly appreciate that. If you um, came up to help yesterday, thank you. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, we really do appreciate it. Our rebuild of our kids' building is continuing to progress uh, with the anticipated date of starting our full kids' ministry again two weeks from today if everything gets finished. And so hopefully um, we'll be on track to do that. Um, but we're really looking forward to that. Um, but again, it's, it's good to see everybody this morning. So May the 18th, May the 19th, 2018, was a day that many, many people had been looking forward to for months. Because this was the day of the royal wedding between Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. Now normally, royal weddings are a big deal, but this one was a little bit different, right? Because Prince Harry was marrying an American. The wedding was held at St. George's Chapel in Windsor with a cost of over $40 million. And while it was a highly anticipated event, only 600 people were actually invited to the ceremony. Most of those were very close family members and and close friends. But there were 1,200 folks who were from the community that were invited to greet the couple after the ceremony on the grounds of the chapel there. There was an estimated 27 million people in the United Kingdom that watched the event on television, 28 million here in America, and and with an estimated audience of well over 100 million people watching around the world. It seemed like this was an event that everyone wanted to see. Now, I have to be honest and tell you, I didn't really care about it at all. And I have to say that for uh, Wayne and Cody, because otherwise they'd make fun of me for even talking about this today. So uh, I just want to say that. But I did find myself on that Saturday morning, just turned the TV on. And I mean, it was on like every channel. And so I did watch just a couple of minutes as the couple made their way out of the chapel and onto their carriage ride down the streets of the city. And the, the, the streets were just lined with people. I mean, it seemed like Everyone wanted to catch a glimpse of the royal couple. Those who were invited absolutely were going to be there. They were not going to miss it. Like, everyone wanted to see it. You know, royal weddings are always a big deal, but this one was a little bit different. And for us, like, we don't have kings and queens in our country, but yet we're still enamored with the fairy tale. And so every time that there is a prince or princess that does something, like usually our eyes are on them. You know, the Bible talks about another wedding that's going to take place at some point in the future. It will far exceed anything that the royal family of England could put together. And I believe it's something that you don't want to miss, something that you can actually be invited to. We're going to talk a little bit about that this morning. But in the year 2017, there was another party that was being planned. This was to be a music festival on a private island in the Bahamas known as the Fire Festival. Now, if any of you have ever heard of the Fire Festival before, you likely have heard of it because you know that it was an epic failure. 
Social media influencers build this as being the party of a lifetime, but yet it fell far short of those expectations. People were told that they were going to have luxury villas where they were staying with five-star meals, but in reality, all of that was a fraud because they got cheese sandwiches to eat, and they had to spend the night in what really amounted to FEMA tents. They were told that something was going to happen. They got far less than that. They thought it was going to be this party of a lifetime, and in reality, what they received was just a nightmare. We're beginning a new series today where we're really what we're doing is going to be talking about entering into a life changing relationship with Jesus. And I absolutely believe that when we enter into a relationship with God through our faith in Jesus, it should change our lives. It's the best decision that we could ever make. But yet, at the same time, for some people, it falls short of their expectations. Seems a lot more like the fire festival than it does the royal wedding. And I think part of that, and, and, and maybe, honestly, maybe this is where some of you are. Like, you're looking at your life, just questioning your faith, like wondering when this is actually going to make a difference because maybe you walked the aisle or prayed a prayer or made that decision. In, in doing so, you thought, well, your life would just magically get better. And you wouldn't have any problems. That if you just did the right things at the right time, or maybe even just didn't do the wrong things, that life would be really easy. And that hasn't been the way it worked out. So now as you're processing your faith, you're wondering, well, what's the the big deal about this anyway? You know, part of it, I think, is expectation. We have to understand that what we go through here is in preparation for what is to come, that something better is coming and all that we go through here will be worth it when we get there. That's part of it. But yet at the same time, when we truly understand the love that God has for us, the grace that God has extended to us, the forgiveness that we have been offered, that will change our lives. And that's what we're going to be talking about in this series. So I hope that you catch a glimpse of some of that over the next few weeks and that the truth of the message of God's love for us does, in fact, change our lives. We begin today, though, in Matthew chapter 22. We're going to be looking at a story that Jesus told, a parable in Matthew 22, verses 1 through 14. So if you've got your Bibles, you can turn there if you don't have a Bible with you. You can navigate your way to our live event and follow along on the YouVersion Bible app. Otherwise, it'll be on the screen as I read it in just a second. But this is a parable that Jesus told. A a parable, meaning a fictional story with a point. When Jesus told parables, they often related to things that can happen in real life, though they are fictional stories, but they represent something else that is happening or is going to happen in real life. And that's what we see in This parable, what is referred to as the parable of the wedding feast, a king throwing a wedding feast for his son. Let me read this, Matthew 22, starting in verse 1, and again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I've prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatted calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off. One to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully and killed them. And the king was angry and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. And he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the the king came in to look at the guests, he saw that there was a man who had no wedding garment on. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? 
He was speechless. Then the king said to his attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. As Jesus begins this parable, he says that the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who was throwing a wedding feast for his son. That phrase, kingdom of heaven, is really important for us to identify and define uh, this morning. Kingdom of heaven is a, a phrase that shows up a lot in the Bible, especially in the New Testament. Different uses for that. Generally speaking, the kingdom of heaven could be viewed as the place where God rules. Sometimes it can be metaphorical. In other words, the kingdom of heaven is at work in our hearts, those of us who are followers of Christ, because God should be ruling in our lives. What is referred to here is something that is coming in the future when God will rule over all the earth. And so Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is coming, and this kingdom that is coming, where the rule of God is going to be, is going to be like a king who throws a wedding feast for his son. And so what Jesus is referring to is the Jewish wedding feast custom. And so we're going to see several of these cultural references throughout the parable that Jesus told. We'll have to talk a little bit about that. But in Jewish culture, wedding feasts were a big deal. It was a big party that often lasted days, sometimes even weeks. The first miracle of Jesus was when he turned water into wine at a wedding feast. And the reason that he did that, the reason he was asked to do that is because they ran out of wine. I don't know if you've ever asked yourself, if you're aware of that story, well, how did they run out of wine? There are potentially two reasons for that. Either one, the disciples crashed the party and they had a little too much to drink, or that the wedding feast went on longer than the host thought it was going to to be, and that's why they ran out. So you can choose whichever one of those you feel like is more fun, maybe, because we don't really know. But so in this case, the king throws a wedding feast for his son, and Jesus says, this is what the kingdom of heaven is going to be like. It's going to be like this incredible party that is thrown by the king. So this is a royal wedding. So on the surface, as we begin to hear the story of Jesus, it sure seems like everyone should want to be there. This is the party of the century. Everyone should want to go. And that's what the kingdom of heaven is like. I don't know if you've ever really given much thought to what heaven is going to be like. I think about it a lot. I want to try to understand what it is that's coming. But I don't know about you. Sometimes I hear people's descriptions of heaven, and honestly, they're just... Meh. You know, it's like, I don't know that that's something that I really am going to get excited about. But over the years, when when there are descriptions of heaven that people give, or or maybe it it shows up in books or movies, I really want to pay attention to it. Again, some of that, if it's you know, Christian stuff to really understand what heaven is going to be like. Sometimes if it's not Christian stuff, I just want to know what people are thinking that the afterlife is going to be like. And so, you know, over the last 10 or 15 years, there's been books that have been released, movies that have come out of those books, things like 90 Minutes in Heaven or Heaven is for Real. In both of those cases, there's stories of people who have died. The Heaven is for Real is about a little boy. Some of you might remember that one. So those people died, and then they were brought back to life. And during those few minutes that they, I guess, maybe were coded, uh, they were able to go to heaven. And so several years ago, I read the book 90 Minutes in Heaven. I was real disappointed. It should be called about five pages in heaven because that was about all the description of heaven that the book included. And so I gotta, I'm going to give you guys a, a promise. If that ever happens to me, I die and I go to heaven, I promise you, and I want you guys to do the same thing for me, I promise to take better notes so that when I get back, it'll be longer than five pages, okay? Can we do that? It's interesting, uh, several years ago, Robin Williams started in this movie called What Dreams May Come. I don't know if you've ever seen that. It's certainly a a secular uh, take on the afterlife, but I thought it was really interesting. Robin Williams in that movie 
in what dreams may come, heaven is pictured as the place that you like the best here. It's very individualized. I'm not, I don't really think that that's what heaven is going to be like, but I thought that was an interesting depiction. And sometimes heaven is pictured as like we're just floating around on clouds, like playing harps and stuff. And I sure hope that heaven is not like that because that sounds real boring. Read about descriptions of heaven in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, which really more precisely is a depiction of the new Jerusalem, the city that descends out of the heavens uh, with the streets of gold and the crystal sea, pearly gates. That's where all that language comes from, comes from the end of the book of Revelation. And so I can read that. I've even seen artist depictions of that scene before, but I'll, I'll just be honest. Like I still struggle to understand what heaven is really going to be like. The reason being, because I'm not sure that I can understand what an existence free from sickness and disease and brokenness and sin, I don't know that I know what that's going to be like. And I can only begin to imagine the party that's going to ensue when that is our experience for the very first time. Now, I'm not a party person introvert, you put me in a room with a lot of people, I'm going to find myself against the back of the wall just watching everything unfold. Likely, I think that that's, that's what is going to happen when I get to heaven too, right? That doesn't mean that I don't want to be there, but I'm just going to find my way against the back wall and just take it all in. But regardless of however you think about that, whatever you picture when you think about heaven, here's the thing that I want you to know. It far exceeds anything that you could ever imagine, and you will absolutely want to be there. No one will want to miss it, but yet some will. Because as Jesus told the story, This parable, he said, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who's throwing a wedding feast for his son. And they got everything together, and then he sent the servants out to bring the people in. But they didn't come. And again, there's some cultural things happening here, so we've got to understand this, that Jewish wedding feasts, it wasn't like they, they sent out invitations with save the dates months in advance. You didn't really know exactly when the wedding was going to take place because the wedding took place when the husband finished preparing the home for his new bride. So you kind of had an idea when that was going to come at at some time, but yet you didn't know exactly when it was. And so when it was finally ready and it was time, you just sent the people out, in this case the servants out, hey, it's time. And usually people would just drop what they were doing and go because who wants to miss the party? And so in this case, it became time for this wedding feast. The servants were sent out, but the people didn't come. Some were uninterested, while others were too busy. And then some were even openly hostile to the invitation that had been given to them. And in the context of that passage, the people that received those invitations that did not go, those were the religious leaders of Jesus' day and the Jewish people. Because the Jewish people, they were the chosen people of God. God had established a covenant with them. But over and over again throughout the history of Israel, they turned their backs on God to follow after other gods, doing other things. But God was patient with them. He was gracious to them. And he continued to pursue them with his love. But yet they continued to turn away. And ultimately, they became even openly hostile to the work of Jesus. And so he is confronting that in them at that moment. And so while what Jesus was referencing in that parable is the Jewish people's really kind of pointed towards those Jewish religious leaders, I want us to stop and think about the responses of the people who were invited. Because those responses can be responses that any of us have. Because first, some were just uninterested. I just didn't think it was that big of a deal. Like, why would I really want to go? And sometimes when we describe heaven in a certain way, people think, I don't understand the big deal about that. And they're uninterested. Others were too busy. Jesus said some went back to their business. They just had stuff to do. 
over the years, I've talked to different people, and they're, they're kind of their attitude of, about things of God and, and, and Christianity was like, I know I need to get settled at some point in the future, but I'll worry about that later. Just got a lot of stuff happening now. It's too busy. And then others were openly hostile. Those are the people that don't want to have anything to do with God or Christianity. You aren't even open to it at all. All of those responses can happen to any of us that we're, some people are uninterested or too busy. And some are openly hostile to the message of Jesus. The king sent his servants to go gather the people who were invited. Hey, it's time to come, but they didn't come. And those who were openly hostile, in fact, even killed those servants who were sent to invite them into the wedding feast. And so the king found out and he sent his soldiers to go and kill those murderous people. And then here was his instruction. He sent them out to go to the main roads and gather anyone who would come. Now, let me just kind of paraphrase what Jesus or what the king would have said in, in the words of Jesus. And he said, Listen, just go find people. Find anyone. It doesn't matter who they are or what they've done. Just go find them. Get them here and fill up the hall because the feast is ready. Now, you might be wondering, where do we fit in this story? So the Jewish people who were the first to receive the invitation, now this is where we show up. Commentators describe this as the, the, the out on the main roads would be a way to describe kind of where the riffraff hang out. These would not be the people that you would normally invite to a wedding feast, but they were people who were ready to party anytime. Not good people, but people. Now, there may not be any of us who would consider ourselves to be the riffraff, but reading back into the cultural world that Jesus was speaking in, that is exactly what we are. Because anybody who is not of Jewish descent is always on the outside looking in. Jewish people didn't have time for people like us. Because they were the chosen people of God. They knew they were better than everybody else. Now, at the time, somebody outside of the nation of Israel could come inside the nation of Israel. You had to convert to Judaism. You could become a part of the people of God. But yet, at the same time, you were always on the outside looking in. And what Jesus is saying is, listen, there's going to be a time where the outsiders aren't on the outside anymore. That everyone who is welcomed in. Thieves. Sinners. Drunkards. Prostitutes. Whoever, just find the people, fill up the hall. And that's where we fit in. The call has been extended to us. Hey, we can be a part of this epic party, but yet at the same time we have to be ready. Because the story of Jesus wasn't over yet. The servants were able to fill up the hall with the people who were out on the main roads, the riffraff of society, and then the king went in, and he saw that the hall was filled with guests, but then he noticed one person who didn't have the right clothes on. And he went to him and said, hey, why are you not wearing your wedding garment? And he was speechless. And the king had his servants bind that man by the hands and feet and throw him out into the darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then Jesus said at the very end of that, for many are called, but few are chosen. Now again, there's some cultural things that are happening here. You've got to understand this. That usually it was typical for the host of the wedding feast to provide the wedding garments for the guests. And so in this case, this, the king is the one who's throwing this party. And so obviously there's enough to go around for everyone. And so the fact that one person doesn't have the right clothes on when everybody else who was there does indicates a rejection of what had been offered to him. He thought he could do it on his own and it would be just fine. When in reality, because he wasn't prepared, he didn't have the right clothes on, 
He was thrown into darkness, which is always pictured as eternal separation from God. Now, your question might be, well, wait a minute. How do we make sure that we get the right clothes on? Because I don't want to get there and get kicked out. That's a great question. Because being able to go to that wedding feast at some point in the future, it's not based on what we do. It's not about how good we are. It's not about the good outweighing the bad. It's about what has been done for us in Jesus Christ. And it's the righteousness of Jesus that allows us to get there. We would never be worthy of going, but it's Jesus who allows us to be there. See, our sin, which we can define as the brokenness that exists in our lives and the brokenness that we create in our lives, that has separated us from God. So because of that separation, there's nothing that we could ever do to earn a relationship with God. We could never be good enough, but God in his love, when we were the riffraff of society, sent Jesus to lay down his life for us to rescue us from our sins so that we could be forgiven. And when we place our faith in Jesus as our Savior, the righteousness of Jesus who never did anything wrong, that is credited to our account so that God no longer looks at us in our sin, but he sees us in the righteousness of Jesus. And that's what makes us worthy. Not what we do, but what Jesus has done when he rescued us. And as we begin to understand that message, that is the message that radically changes our lives. When we recognize that individually there is nothing that we could ever do to be good enough, that we were lost and without hope, but when we were lost, God extended his love to us and rescued us from our sin. It changes the way that we view ourselves. It changes the way that we view the world around us. It changes the way that we treat others around us because we know we're not good enough. They're not good enough. We're all in the same boat in this together. All of us desperately in need of the grace of God to be at work in us and transform us. And that changes everything. See, there is a party being planned. And you don't want to miss it. I don't know what you think about heaven. But listen, it will far exceed anything that any of us could ever imagine. And the only way that we get there is through faith in Jesus. And that changes our lives. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thanks for... sending the servants out. Into the main roads. Where the riffraff hang out. So that we could be welcomed in. And Father, it's my hope that everyone who is here and those that are watching online would have made that decision to trust Christ as their Savior. And God, that over these next few weeks that you would help us more and more to understand just how deep and wide your love for us is. That when we could do nothing, you did everything to bring us into a relationship with you. And in the midst of our struggles, may we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, the joy of knowing us, endured the cross, despising its shame, and is now seated at your right hand. May we consider him who endured such things for us so that we would not grow weary and lose heart. And through the work of your spirit, God, continue to change us. Thank you for rescuing us. and giving us a home with you forever. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You know, if you do have questions about anything that you heard today, maybe you've never made that decision to trust Christ as your Savior because maybe you thought for years that you had to do something to earn your way into that relationship. But if you have questions today, Don't leave without talking to somebody. 
You can talk to me. Find Wayne after the service. Find Melissa. She'll probably be out in the lobby somewhere. But we would love to have that conversation with you. The conversation to help you to know for sure how you're going to make it to that epic celebration one day. Because I want you to have the hope of eternal life. Cody, lead us in that last song. Wounded and forsaken, I was shattered by the fall. Broken and forgotten, feeling lost and all alone. Summoned by the King into the Master's court. Lifted by the Savior and cradled in His arm. I was carried to the table. Seen it where I don't belong. Carry to the table. Swept away by his love. And I don't see my brokenness anymore. And I'm seated at the table of the Lord. I'm carried to the table. The table of the Lord. Fighting thoughts of fear and wondering why he called my name. Am I good enough to share this cup? The world has left me lame. Even in my weakness, the Savior called my name. In His holy presence, I am healed and unashamed. I was carried to the table. Seated where I don't belong Carried to the table Swept away by His love And I don't see my brokenness anymore and I'm seated at the table of the Lord. I'm carried to the table. The table of the Lord. I was carried to the table. Seated where I don't belong Carry to the table Swept away by his love And I don't see my brokenness anymore Seated at the table of the Lord, I'm carried to the table. The table of the Lord, I'm carried to the table. The table of the Lord. I certainly wasn't ready. I never heard that song before and um, was 
punching myself in my seat to not come up here just bawling. Um, man, that is uh, those words, yeah. So I thank you so much for being here this morning. Um, the grace of God is good to us, and we certainly don't deserve it and have been invited into a relationship with him through the work of Jesus. And so, Bill, thank you for that, uh, that fresh reminder for us this morning. The reality is, is that he's offered that invitation to us all, and so let's not wait, let's not tarry in receiving it. Um, before you go, um, continuing into worship, uh, one of the things that we do here at the table is that we give, um, and on, the, on your way out there's baskets, and if you choose to give online, you can visit our website online, but when you give, um, you give to the mission of the table, and we really appreciate that because we get to go into this community and serve the Lord and extend the invitation. God has allowed for us to extend his invitation to the people in this community. And when you give, it goes directly to us extending the, that invitation of the, the gospel message to the people in this community and around the world. And so thank you for uh, giving of your resources and your time. Those of you who came up and served uh, yesterday, I was there. Um, I didn't do a whole bunch because it was like a lot of like hard work and stuff. And I was like, more like of a, like, yeah, you guys can do this. Like, we got you. You need some water, whatever it is. But thank you so much for doing that. Uh, and we're so uh, thankful that you would be here with us today. Um, with nothing else, you guys have a great rest of your day. Also, just like a week before football season gets started. So just pray for the Cowboys and, and all of that stuff. Thank you for watching. For more information on The Table Community Church, visit us at our website at www.thetablecc.com.